I'm Kelly Vaughn and welcome to Inside Indie. And tonight we're going to be talking about addiction. Uh, the number of people suffering from addiction in the U.S. is astounding, unbelievable. According to uh, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, nearly 20 million Americans aged 12 and older battles a substance use disorder and that's, those figures are actually from 2017, so I suspect the numbers are even higher today, but certainly those numbers, that's not in Marion County, right? That's not in Hamilton County. That's not in Brown County, right? Wrong. Um, and in fact, there is a problem and has been for some time in Brown County, which is the subject of a, an awesome, just truly awesome documentary uh, that's called The Addict's Wake. And here to tell us about the documentary is its executive producer, right? Right. Lisa Hall, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me and for the opportunity to talk about this film and, and this issue that is plaguing our nation from east to west coast and every county in between. Right, right. And, yeah. uh, and, and you wouldn't think Brown County, which is known for tourism and the beauty and the fall. Tell us a little bit about Brown County Set us up with that and, and, and so we can get an idea of what it's like there. Well, it is an incredible community. And my husband and I moved there full time in 2017. And just because it is Brown County and, and the idyllic uh, portrayal that you know we see when we drive through our downtown, it looks exactly like straight out of a Hallmark movie, right? So we moved there without really doing a, a lot of research. And I loved the people that I had met. And uh, once I started getting involved with the community to try to meet people, and because uh, we moved and I, I knew no one. And um, I started hearing these murmurings um, about the underbelly of Brown County. And I thought it would be interesting to film there because it is this uh, hallmark looking community, yeah. uh, but the, with a very, very sick underbelly. And mm -hmm. I started hearing stories of women who were incarceration in our Brown County Correction Center and thought, oh my gosh, you know, this is, these women are no different than me. They had uh, jobs, they had careers, families, homes, cars, lives that in a vulnerable moment, uh, they decided to use today's very highly, highly addictive drugs. And it doesn't mm. take long in today's world of, of drugs mm. before that hook gets set so deep, then all of a sudden you can't break away from it. Okay. And so I started hearing these stories and, and you know, um, when I got the invitation to tell these stories, I said, absolutely, yes, there are stories to tell. And we have to tell them until we reverse the trajectory. Okay. And I was a new girl in Brown County. Right, right. So you said you got an invitation, because I was going to ask you a little bit about yeah. your background in film and that. I mean, is this something you've always done? Um, or is this your first This documentary? is my, my first film. Wow. Uh, it was never even on my radar. It was on God's radar, there was go, not on mine. And through the power of social media, I had put uh, a condolence post up on, on website on Facebook mm -hmm. because there had been three young men in Carmel who had overdosed fatally within mm -hmm. weeks of each other. And I had several friends who knew these families. And so through a post that I had put, I had a woman reach out to me um, and she asked me if there was a problem in Brown County. And I said, yes, there is. Are there stories to tell? And I said, yes, there are. And would you like to, to make a documentary? And I said, sure. Wow, just like that, okay. <laughs> okay, and I had no idea what I was saying yes to, but um, I was willing to learn, I was willing to figure it out because I knew the power of film. Uh, film is, is a wonderful way to help people walk in the shoes of someone else when they're not doing that in real life. Mm -hmm. And I knew that from the very start, we needed to have more compassion towards folks who were struggling with substance use. Wow. wow. So take us, obviously, we'd love to show the documentary, but um, our focus obviously is on you and the story. T tell us a little bit about the documentary and if someone to watch it, if someone were to watch it, what 
what do they see and what can they expect? Well, I think what makes the Addicts Wake documentary different, because as soon as I said yes, of course, I'm researching, you know, what other docs are out there regarding addiction. And when I looked at the close knit community that Brown County is, and it is a tight, tight knit community. And it what one of the things that makes it so wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought, how do I want this documentary to be different? And the difference is we really, we show four subjects, um, a a couple who experienced loss of a son in 2017. We show uh, a young man who's in active addiction all during the filming for two and a half years and ends up losing his family and he made it. You know, he made it. He's he's doing well today. Mm. But I was nervous, you know, because it was very tenuous, um, his overdosing and back in jail and blah, blah, blah. It's this vicious cycle that that happened. Uh, But I I knew I wanted to show these families, the four families, but what were the effects of their situation on the community? So that's the wake. That's where the the title, The Wake, came from. And it's like when you are driving a boat and you're the driver, so you're that person battling substance use, you very rarely look behind you when you're driving a boat because you're watching to see what's in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. So that you're not going to run into anybody or another boat. But what they don't see in that one decision to use is what is the wake? What is that churning water behind the boat? And that's what I was seeing uh, was the community piece, was how does a community suffer? And what Mm -hmm. are all of the consequences for communities that are really battling uh, pandemic use uh, of highly addictive drugs? When you said addicts wake, I actually thought you were talking about what precedes the funeral. Right. Is there a double meaning there? There there certainly is, because we're losing so many people uh, to substance use and abuse. And, and so, yes, there's a double meaning. But the title really came from a picture that my mm-hmm. husband had taken. And I was so intrigued uh, by just the churning of these waters, because we were facing backward in this boat. And I looked over at him. We were on a vacation, and I said... Mm-hmm. This is what happens to a community. And the person, persons who use have no idea what's going on behind them. They have no idea. And, and to, to kind of um, mm-hmm. illustrate this point, I was in, I worked with ladies on Sundays in incarceration. And they all knew that I was involved in this project. And so when we had the trailer done, I took it in. And you're not allowed to have your phone when you go in to minister mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. ladies. So I... Sorry, Sheriff Scott, I snuck it in. <laughs> and I, so they got on one side of the table, and they were all just so anxious to see it. And so I'm showing them like this with the camera, you know, behind me. And they're so excited, and they're lined up, and there's probably eight or nine ladies. And then all of a sudden, their countenance change. The tears start coming. Uh, and I'm like, no, no, don't cry. Don't, do don't cry. Don't cry. <laughs> Please don't do that. I'm going to get in trouble. You're going to give me away. <laughs> so we got everybody back to their seats, and we got tissues passed out. And I uh-huh. said, OK, let's talk about the tears. Tell me about the tears. This was probably in December of 2019 or or January 20, somewhere early in 20, where we were still filming. Mm. And they said it's the first time they had seen what their decision to use had cost their families, had Ah. cost others. And I thought, okay. So when they're in the thick of it, they can't see that. No, it's a very, and and I I don't say this without compassion, but it's a very selfish disease. (coughs) Excuse me, If if you're in active use, your only concern is how I'm going to get the next high. That's all you're concerned about. Your whole day is about how you're going to find the drugs you need because your body is going to undergo so many withdrawals without it. And it's ugly and it's, it's hard. The withdrawal is very, very powerful. And you're very, very sick. And it doesn't take long to... to I don't want to feel that way. Uh-huh. And so you chase... So you don't have to go through that pain. And so you can see this vicious cycle that is started. And, you know, I've had vulnerable, dark moments in my own life. And I often think, what if I had decided to just numb or try to escape that one situation for, for, you know, two weekends? 
And that's all it takes with today's properties of these highly addictive drugs. Yeah, I wanted to talk about this. So drugs of today are different than those in the past? And I'm not, I have not heard that. What I heard more recently was more the common person who necessarily isn't interested in getting high is being exposed to um, medications right. um, that are quite addictive painkillers and that kind of thing. Are we talking about the same thing? Are we talking about even those who are doing it for rec recreational purposes, even what they're taking is more addictive? What, what are we talking about? Well, it's terrifying out there in the world of drugs because if you don't know where they're coming from, there is a huge chance that it's been laced with um, all sorts of things. But right now, most of the heroin that we even talk about today is mm -hmm. uh, predominantly fentanyl. And mm. fentanyl, what you, you, people say to me all the time, well, if they know it's so dangerous, why do they do it? And people use fentanyl, if you're, if you're you know, in that cycle of addiction, you use fentanyl because it's the greatest high you've ever had. And it takes you 50 times higher than heroin did. Okay, right? And, and so, but there's, comes with that great high comes great risk. Our bodies are not built to tolerate mm -hmm. that kind of toxicity. And so that's why the overdose rates are completely, you know, off the charts with, with fentanyl. Yeah. I found out recently I had a procedure and they had given me that. It made me very sick. Yes. I was sick for a couple of days and I told them the next time I get these shots in my back and I said, don't you give me that mess. Yes. Uh, and this is under a doctor's care. Um, and, and yet you don't hear about people going in for that. They, get, they use it for surgery all the time. Most people don't come out addicted right? that I know of. Well, in the 90s, where I really believe this crisis was fueled and founded, you know, the, pers the prescribing doctors were giving way more pills than somebody needed to recover from surgery. Mm -hmm. And again, when you're talking about Oxycontin and you're talking about um, these very strong painkillers, mm -hmm. they, you know, it's proven now that we knew, the pharmaceutical companies knew that these drugs were, would be addictive. Oh yeah, that's the big lawsuit. But that's the big lawsuit. Yeah, which I'm not sure they got their due, but that's another show. That, that could be a whole <laughs> nother show. And, and so, um, you know, it just has kind of started this, this new trend. And even marijuana today is very boutique marijuana. It's not, uh, the pot that was there when okay. when I was in school, it, you know, it's very refined, and and that's why so many go to meth or heroin, Gosh. because the pot is now even more expensive because it's it's stronger pot. They've defined pot now for all different kinds of uses, mm -hmm. and and it's just a whole different. It's different, a whole different, different world. Okay. Yeah. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, okay. we're going to talk more about how people get started in the first place yeah. and what this documentary is doing to help the nation heal. Can't wait. All right, when we come back. We're back here on Inside Indy and continuing our discussion with executive producer Lisa Hall. And she is behind the phenomenal documentary, The Addict's Wake. You've been working on this for some time. What do you know about this whole epidemic? I guess it would be pandemic. <laughs> you know, we went through COVID, now we're still dealing with addiction. What do you know now that we probably don't know? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Or that you were surprised to learn. Like, oh I my had gosh. No clue. Yeah. I mean, so many things that I've learned in the last four and a half years. We started filming in August of 2019. We, we completed filming for the original film in January of 21. And I knew nothing about medically assisted treatment to help people come off. I did not understand Narcan. Narcan saves lives. I mean, I could list several things that I've learned and probably my narrative has changed because of information. You know, we develop mm. these narratives about substance use, we develop our opinions. And the truth is 
the reason, one of the reasons, because I had four very clear-cut goals for doing this film, is we did not have the emotional awareness and understanding of substance use that I feel like we need in this nation. We're so quick to judge. We're so quick to make our own conclusions based on our own limited knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so when I entered into this project, I knew I needed to have my mind, my heart well open so that I could learn. And what mm. I've learned is we Narcan because we're saving lives and we're saving human potential. There is a young man in our educational edit, and to his best recollection, he's been narcan 32 times. Now, you just wonder how much his body can continue mm. to, to rebound from an overdose. But I, I'm so thankful that he's still here. He's still seeking recovery. He still is in that battle every day. And... You know, that's important because what if that 32nd time is the time that he does recover, he becomes a contributing citizen, he reunites mm -hmm. with his family, kids that he hasn't seen for, you know, a number of years. I mean, we want this kind of redemption for people, right? And so that narrative for me on Narcan was a total, total flip. I just didn't know enough about it to have a well-informed opinion. And I, I think the other thing, and we're, we're coming out with a version this year for law enforcement and first responders because those folks are boots on the ground. Many of them are pulling up on overdoses in, in communities where they went to school with these people. They mm -hmm. know their families. They know their parents. Their kids mm -hmm. all play mm -hmm. together. You know, there's a lot of trauma involved um, in oh, this. Yeah, yeah. And so um, we're really advocating for allowing medically assisted treatment. That is your methadone. That is your, um, um, I, I'm going to butcher the name, um, your Suboxone, your Ibu, ah, what is it called? I, I can't, I've never been able to say it, but it's, okay. it, they're synthetic okay. to help um, your nerve your nerves, it blocks the cravings. Okay. And so it is a very mild synthetic use of whatever drug you're seeking to get off of. Okay. And it's super important. It's like a diabetic getting their insulin. Mm -hmm. We don't ever say, oh, let's not talk about that. Or, <laughs> yeah. you know, should, let's you, not give it to them. <laughs> should you really have insulin? You right, know? Right. And so it's no different. And, and Dr. William Cook out of Scott County really, really helped me to understand the importance of allowing medically assisted treatment to, to folks okay. um, to really help them stabilize their lives. Okay. So those are just a couple of the things I've learned. There's numerous oh, others. Oh, that's very powerful. So now I, I saw a part of the documentary and there's somebody by the name of Cunningham that you, tell us about who, this is someone who passed away and you were dealing with the family? Um, actually, that was Caleb Joy. Uh, that's passed. the okay. young man who passed. Brown County experienced in 2017 six overdose deaths of young men who were longtime families in the community, generational mm. families. And in a community of 15,000, that's very felt. Those deaths are very felt. And the community was just kind of like, oh, my gosh. And that's the time when yeah. we oh. moved there. So I was hearing about these deaths. I was getting in on them, you know, last as they were kind of, it had already happened, but still hearing about the, the consequences and repercussions of these deaths. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this has got to mm. stop. And so um, Michelle and Corey, he is a pastor within our community. She's a fourth grade teacher at Helmsburg Elementary and they lost their son, Caleb. And mm. we thought that story was very important to include because it really shows that it's not the people from the other side of the tracks. It's not the inner city crack cocaine. This, this mm -hmm. touches everybody, mm -hmm. everybody. And we're in screenings, and I always ask, if you're brave enough, could you raise your hand if you know someone who's been affected by, by substance use disorder? And, you know, my husband hates when I quote statistics unfoundly, but 90% of the room raises their hands, and I'm going to bet the other 10% were just scared to because wow. everyone knows somebody who's dealt with this. So then John's story, um, and this is how sweet this whole process was. This I would, is Cunningham? This is John Cunningham. Okay. John's story, I was in the uh, town hall in Brown County, and I'm, I forget what even my, my business was to be at the window. And this 
woman over here kind of shyly says to me, are you the one making the documentary? And I said, yes. And she goes, have you heard of John Cunningham's story? And I said, no. And she goes, oh, you need to hear that story. And she said, here's his mother's number. You should call her. So I called her to get John's number. John and I met for coffee. And mm -hmm. John's story is nothing short of miraculous. And he will tell you that. And his enthusiasm for recovery and and his story is our hope story is he the teacher in the no okay he, i'm getting there <laughs> he is the recover out loud they okay. he and his now wife megan uh, they were not married when we started filming but she, they since have married they founded recover out loud where it was a group a community that came together that wasn't so concerned about anonymity and right. so okay. they felt talking about it, shining Facebook. light. Face, Facebook. They went live on Facebook. And really, it, it, was, it was very, very um, fun to watch this grow okay. over the course of filming. And he looks at it, that's a part of the healing. It's nothing to be ashamed of, to get rid of the stigmas. Get rid of stigma and shame. Stigma and shame was one, the first goal of the film, was to, to break the walls of that. Because it's still keep, keeping people mm -hmm. from getting the help that they need. And, mm -hmm. you know, in a small community where everybody knows the business of others, that stigma and shame can be very profound. And so we really, really wanted to kind of, you know, break down those walls. Okay. And their group does that. And John was looking at 30 years in a federal prison, um, mm. got, an ex got a sentence, and then really started to, to evaluate his life and understand that he needed to start making the changes in his life while he was you know, in incarceration, and he did. And he, he was being so proactive in his recovery. The judge saw this and let him out in two and a half years. Wow. And John's, Now that's some serious recovery there. It's some serious <laughs> miracle working there. And John was determined not to waste what chance that he had been given. And so he has, he is on fire for recovery. He will help anybody find it. And mm -hmm. he's just, a, he's in a, a really shining example of how you can turn your life around. Okay. And it's not easy. A, a, a line out of your documentary, which, which caught my attention, addiction, quit, die, or jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course he chose quit life, That's, which is pretty powerful. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and now he'll tell you that recovery is the greatest thing he could ever have imagined. I mean, you know, he, he just lives just such a vibrant life. And, and mm -hmm. you know, Michelle and Corey, who lost a son to this issue, mm -hmm. you know, they've turned their pain into purpose. And I think that is the secret sauce of healing communities is when people can turn their pain into purpose. And now we're... we're um, the, the state is really certifying peer recovery coaches. So people that are in long-term recovery can now actively help others find recovery. It's just a beautiful thing to watch. It really is. And, and I don't have lived experience. So for me to walk alongside of somebody, um, I, I, I can do and I have. Mm -hmm. But it's not like a peer recovery coach who understands every nuance about you know, fighting cravings, not calling your drug dealer, all these things that are just so embedded in them during their times of use. And so mm -hmm. it's just, um, it's, it's a really, really beautiful thing to watch when you can find people in recovery dialing in their, their purpose. Okay. Um, as executive producer and, and creator of the content of this, what did you want to see happen with the film uh, once completed? Mm -hmm. what, did, what did you want? I hoped deeply that this film would. I don't even know why I'm getting teary. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I think because there's come loss, you know, in this process. But um, I was really hoping communities could come together. We shed light on it. And then all of a sudden people go, okay, this is where we are. Let's have impactful conversation and let's go and make real changes. Let's not just give it airspace. Let's not just talk about it in the newspapers or on the news. Let's become active participants in healing and changing our communities. And it is beginning, and I've, I've watched it, and I have testimonials coming in that 
communities are having conversations that they never thought they'd have. And the films, it's like the film is a tool that's giving them permission to do so. Okay. And that's an incredible thing. I had no idea what God had intended for this film, but mm -hmm. that is what is happening. And I am so thrilled okay. and grateful. Uh, in, in wrapping up, how can we see it? Um, we have not released the, the feature link for on a streaming service yet. Um, we're still trying to do community screenings. We want, we want to come in. We want to help you um, have this event. We want to help you invite the, the right people to have these meaningful, impactful conversations. Gotcha. But in November 22, PBS did pick up the film, a 56-minute abridged version of the film, which so we had to give it a pretty significant haircut. But they picked up a 56-minute version, and it went out to 91, what well, went out to all 341 public television stations and 91% of the stations had scheduled it for an air day as of January, which okay. means about 110 million households have an opportunity to see it. Um, so in saying that, I signed a three-year deal with NIDA, which is a content distributor for PBS. And right now you can Google the Addicts Wake, it'll come up on YouTube and you can watch the 56 minute version uh, in the comfort of your own home. Wow, okay, okay. And we've got that information on the screen. Okay. If people want to tune in. That's um, great, yeah. Lisa, we appreciate you coming in, um, doing what you've done thus so far and then coming in and sharing your story and the impact you're having and doing God's work. That's the way yeah. I look at it. Wow. I always say he's the he's the main director of this film. <laughs> and I told him I'd step into this project. But if I made a step in the wrong direction, I asked him to slam the door hard because sometimes I'm thick and I yeah. need to hear that door slammed hard. And you know what? He just opened up doors for for four and a half wow. years so far. Wow. Nice. So and I see more to come. I think you're having a great impact. Thank you so much. Thank you for having for me, joining Kelly. us. All Appreciate right. the time. All right. And thank you for joining us. I'm Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. Through a nationwide network of food banks, Feeding America serves virtually every community in the United States. See how you can help your community. Visit feedingamerica.org.